So, I just want to first off tell you sort of a little bit about my lab and what we do, because it is sort of related to, to this movie, and then we can just tell you a few just interesting facts that are related to the movie that you may or may not know about. Um, so, my lab studies fish behavior and communication and how the brain controls behaviors, especially social behaviors. So a lot of fish are very uh, social, they do lots of aggressive behaviors and reproductive behaviors, and so we're looking at how they communicate during those behaviors, so what sensory systems do they use, what signals are they sending out in the environment, and what are they using to receive those signals, um, and then how does the brain control all of this. Okay, and so one of the reasons we work on fishes is because they're actually um, the most abundant vertebrate group. So over half of vertebrates are fishes. So if you combine all the other vertebrates together, so mammals, you know, birds, amphibians, reptiles together, it still doesn't equal the number of species that are of fishes. <laughs> so they're a really good model for doing a lot of things. They have all kinds of social behaviors that are even very similar to our own. They have social hierarchies, like even humans do. If you, you know, you guys went to high school and stuff, so you know there's, you know, dominant kids and, <laughs> and the, the ones that get bullied on, you know, and so the same thing exists in fishes, and so if we can understand how those things are working in the brain in a simple system like, like the fish, we can get insights into the other types of behaviors. Okay, so, this, I've seen this movie once when it came out in the theater, so I don't remember all of the details, but there's a couple of relevant facts, I think, that we can talk about that are related to science and research. And Because when you see films like this, this movie and, and Finding Nemo are great because they sort of raise awareness about the ocean and, you know, just getting people involved in caring about marine animals and the ocean in general. So they're good in that respect, but in terms of storytelling, they need to take some liberties, and there's always some inaccuracies in the stories, right? Some are obvious, some are not not so obvious if you don't know about, about them. Um, but there are a lot of things that they get right in the movies, and also things that are sort of right, but not quite accurate, you know? But again, all those inaccuracies are due to storytelling, or things that just didn't work with the animation. So we act, I actually have a colleague who is a consultant on both of these movies. He's a, um, he does biomechanics in fish. And so they asked him to dis, you know, help them design how these fish move, um, how the octopus moves, and other things in the movie, that, so they get it really accurate. But because of the animation, there are certain things they couldn't, they couldn't do. And so that's where some of those, those things come in. So I just want to tell you a couple things about Dory. So one of the obvious things is that she has that short-term memory loss, and that kind of stemmed from the fact that it was originally thought that fish only had you know a few second memory, but that's basically through research has been very debunked. So that's that's not the case. A lot of fish can remember things for months or years afterwards. So. But the short-term memory loss thing, you know, that's a real thing. It's called retrograde amnesia. <laughs> and so it's a problem with a part of the brain called the hippocampus that prevents you from consolidating short-term memories to long-term memories. You know, so that, that is a real thing, but the fact that fish only remember for three seconds is not, is not really true. <laughs> um, that dory is a surgeon fish. And so it's a group of fishes. They're, they're called surgeon fishes because a lot of them have a little um, spine at the base of their tail fin, their caudal fin, that is really sharp and it's like a scalpel. So the scalpel to, to surgeon connection was made there. Um, let's see what else about to worry. Oh, the other main thing is that both of these movies talk a lot about parental care in fish. <laughs> And most fishes don't have any form of parental care. There are a lot of fish species that do have parental care, and that can range from, you know, sometimes the males take care of the young, sometimes the females do, sometimes both both parents do. So when they show, um, you know, Marlin and, and Nemo, Marlin taking care of the eggs in that in the first movie, that that's real. That does happen in, in that many fishes, but. Once they hatch and become little baby fish, there's very little parental care. 
and the, the dory species actually has no parental care at all. So the way they spawn is that the male and the female will kind of swim up rapidly in the water column, along with usually a group of them will do this, and they'll release sperm and eggs into the water, and they get fertilized right there, and then they go off sort of in the plankton and develop, and then eventually hatch. So once they do that spawning act, there's no contact between parent, parents and, and the young. So that's, that's a big, you know, liberty they took with the, the storyline. <laughs> um, what else? I think Julia is going to say a couple things about how fish actually communicate, because obviously fish don't talk like they do in the movies. <laughs> but they do communicate. They use sounds, they use chemical signals, visual signals, all kinds of different things. And then she'll also mention there's an underlying theme in this movie especially about environmental issues. Um, and so she'll mention some of the anthropogenic effects that you know, we as humans have on, on fish and the ocean. Yeah, so like Karen said, fish have a lot of different ways that they communicate. So they can see, they can smell, they can taste, feel, um, and hear. So obviously in the movie they're all brightly colored, um, so they can see those colors. And the cool thing about fish is they can actually see colors that we can't see. Um, so when you look at a fish and you think it looks pretty, imagine the potentially hundreds of colors that you can't actually see that make it uniquely identified and able to tell species apart. Um, they also, a lot of fish produce sounds, so obviously they don't talk, um, right? <laughs> but they do produce sounds that are used for communicating within a species, um, as well as they can distinguish between species. And so the fish can actually hear sounds. Um, so my research actually looks at the impact of anthropogenic noise on fish, and so how do those sounds impact uh, fish communication and behavior? Um, and they, can also, I'm going to focus on communication first, right? So they can hear, they can also feel things. So you have a touch system, you can feel when someone touches you. Uh, fish also have an additional sensory system, it's called the, the mechanosensory lateral line. It actually lets them feel water movements around them. So when you see the uh, other dory-like fish, the tangs schooling, a lot of that is actually done through those water movement cues that they're picking up on so that they can move in unison. Because um, I think there's one point where they like flip the tanks upside down when they're escaping, and you can see them like schooling together in, in some of the aquarium scenes. Um, all of that's done through the lateral line. Um, they also can taste and smell. Um, so they have epithelium just like humans have. It's by their eyes underneath. It's in this little cavity. Um, and this detects waterborne odorants or chemicals. So they can sense their environment around them by detecting those chemicals not only in their nose, but also on their body, so they have taste buds not just in their mouth, but on the sides of their body, um, and also other chemical sensing cells, so they can literally taste the water that they're swimming in, um, which is a huge thing when it comes to environmental contaminants, which this movie talks, and not talks about, but has this underlying um, theme throughout. So one of the things that they actually show a lot is um, Dory ends up in that aquarium because she gets caught in a little plastic ring and they try to save her, and that's how she ends up there. Well, Karen and I were looking it up earlier, and some of these plastics stick around for like 400 years. That's a long time for something to break down. Um, but some of these like waterborne chemicals can affect fish communication because they will actually communicate with each other by um, releasing urine, so they'll pee at each other to signal things like social status and reproductive status and identity. Um, and so when those environmental contaminants, which they show in the movie, by like this murky, gross, ugly water, that can actually affect that chemical communication. Yeah, I know that in the other you have to show like fish, well, and they can't talk to each other, but they do like move whatever, mm -hmm. movements or smell or that kind of stuff to communicate with each other. Like, is there anything we can look for in the movie that, should, that does show? Like, do they incorporate that or is it mostly just like, fish talking to each other? They definitely have schooling. Yeah, schooling. Um, Echolocation, it's not fish, but that's a big, um, that's accurate in these fish. Um, and even like some of the anatomical stuff, so she talked about the biomechanics of the swimming, but even the um, like the whale sharks that they show and the um, beluga, they're all anatomically correct. So they show them with these tiny little eyes, but that's because they aren't heavily relying on vision. Mm. Um, echolocation is probably the biggest, like most scientifically accurate communication thing though. The, the whale sharks, too, another thing. So whale sharks are the largest fish 
in the ocean. They can get up to like 40 feet long, and but they're fish, they're not whales, so they don't speak whale. Like <laughs> Dory doesn't speak whale either, but um, they eat plankton though. So they're the biggest fish in the ocean, they're a shark, but their teeth are very tiny and they feed on plankton. And so one of the things you'll see is when they feed the whale shark, it's look at what's in the bucket that they're feeding them. Because <laughs> they really only eat very tiny organisms in the ocean, not, not large fish. So they're not big predators. <laughs> so. Cool. But otherwise, communication-wise, yeah, there's not a lot of... Really it's mostly eyes. talking. <laughs> yeah. Want to give us an example of a fish sound? Fish sound? Do a fish sound. What does it really sound like? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be able to do that. Go for it. So, like, our, the fish we study is a cichlid from Africa, and they make sounds, and it kind of sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> so nothing like words or anything, and then there's other ones that make boat whistle sounds that kind of sound like ah ah. That's what I was going to do. Yeah, it's easier <laughs> for, a long, for a long periods of time. So they're they're sort of simple, but um, they have very specific meanings. So they'll do different sounds for aggression, different sounds for reproduction, things like that. Stress sounds are often different too. So. <laughs>